Well, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, uh, we are so excited to present this visiting artist, uh, visiting artist series talk tonight with Samuel Levi Jones. Um, on behalf of the students, staff, and volunteers at the IU Eskenazi Museum of Art, thank you for joining us. Um, we're really excited. My name is Mark DaCosta. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I'm a museum host and a graduate student studying cybersecurity risk management with a concentration in business. So, yep, thank you all for being here. Um, okay, first we wish to acknowledge and um, honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington was built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and the Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. The IU uh, Eskenazi Museum of Art would like to thank the museum's National Advisory Board co-chairman Greg and Judy Somerville and National Advisory Board member Linda Watson for championing the museum's contemporary art efforts. We would also like to say a big thank you to the museum's director circle and IU Fo Foundation's Women's Philanthropy Leadership Council, whose support is critical in enabling us to host First Thursdays and this visiting artist series. So. Mm -hmm. We appreciate uh, your patience with any unexpected challenges that might arise, um, as this is our first first Thursday, yay, and first visiting artist series talk with everyone back. Um, if there are any connection issues for those viewing at home, please um, know that this program is being recorded. For those who are interested in availability of recordings of artist talks, please subscribe to the Museum News uh, for updates or check the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, before release, recordings are sent for professional review of closed captioning for accessibility. So. Um, and then for those of you who are in the Martin Commons with us right now, um, emergency exits are located to the right of the screen, um, and as well as the doors you entered through. So, Cool. Um, for virtual participants, uh, a few tips for optimizing your experience today. There also are several ways to adjust the size of images on your screen. We invite you to try this now as we sometimes receive this question after the program. Um, if you're connecting from a PC or laptop, at the top of your screen, look for view options. Uh, click on the view options to select settings that work best for you. The vertical bar between the slides and the speaker slides left and right to make the presentation slides or the people speaking bigger or smaller. So, <laughs> um, and then for those connecting with the phone or iPad, you may be able, you may be able to uh, enlarge the images by pinching the screen. So uh, live closed captioning is available for the program as well. This can be turned on from your Zoom toolbar. Awesome, okay, cool. So with me today are Elliot Reichert, welcome, curator of contemporary art at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, as well as Laura Shepper, public experiences manager, um, and also Samuel Levi Jones. Welcome, welcome. The Eskenazi Museum values students, and I have the great privilege of introducing the visiting artist. Uh, Samuel Levi Jones was, Jones was born and raised in Marion, Indiana, trained as a photographer and multidisciplinary artist. He earned a BA in communication studies from Taylor University and a BFA from Heron School of Art and Design in 2009. He received his MFA in studio art from Mills College in 2012, and his work is informed by historical source material uh, and early modes of representation in documentary practice. He explores the framing of power structures and struggles between exclusion and equality by desecrating historical material, then reimagining new works. Uh, Jones investigates issues of manipulation and rejection of control in a broad sense. He is the recipient of the 2014 Joyce Alexander Vine Artist Prize awarded to him by the Studio Museum in Harlem. And his work is in prominent private and public collections, including the SF MoMA, the Rubel Family Collection, LACMA, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, to name a few. Um, so with that, welcome. And I will hand the floor to Mr. Reichert for discussion. Yeah, we're, uh, <laughs> it's a really fascinating uh, dual format we're trying out tonight. So thank you for your patience. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Sam and I have been having a wonderful conversation in the past couple hours. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is this a good distance for the mic? Okay. Yeah, yeah I got to eat it. That's what Sam says. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to start um, by asking Sam a question about a work that um, I've 
felt to be significant to your practice and I think you also felt was a, a touchstone to uh, the development of your work overall and later on. Uh, this is a work called 48 Portraits Underexposed, which I believe you first made in 2012. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And so there it is on the screen behind me. And uh, that's a four by, I should know my math, 16, eight, nine, 10 grade, 12 grade, oh no, of um, portraits uh, that you made from uh, pulped paper, pulped from a 1972 set of encyclopedias. Uh, made in response to uh, an important art historical work by the German artist Gerhard Richter. So in 1972, Richter uh, produced a series called 48 Portraits of uh, prominent philosophers, thinkers, scientists, all men, uh, white men. And uh, that work was exhibited at the, the Venice Biennale um, in 1972. Little mask issue here. And, um, and so you made your work in response to that. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about that work and how that work became um, kind of influential to your practice going forward. I keep staring at the screen because like I'm in all of the uh, the resolution of the projection. It's really good. Um, yeah, so I made that work <clears throat> in graduate school and that was sort of like, that was how I got into working with the books. And, but when I first saw Richter's work, I learned that the source images were from the encyclopedia. And oddly enough, I got my hands on a set of encyclopedias from 1972 um, and just started thumbing through the pages. And most of the people who represented were predominantly white men, very few women, very few other types of people. And <clears throat> I wanted to create my own version of the 48 portraits. And so I imaged 24 black men, 24 black women who could have been represented, imaged in the encyclopedia that year who were not. And so the images that you saw, the paper was actually recycled paper from that set of encyclopedia that I recycled by hand, I actually used a food blender, it took a long time. Um, and I sourced the images from different source materials such as um, encyclopedia on African-Americans or women and scanned those images and then printed them on the paper, enlarged them, they're underexposed. So the underexposure of it is sort of a, a literal and a metaphorical thing of saying, sort of dealing with the underexposure of them and sort of fighting for visibility. But when you look at them in person, they just look like black squares. And so a lot of people, there, are number, there have been a number of times where people just was like, what's going on here? And I say, do you see the images of the portraits? And they, they're like, oh. So once your eyes focus so that they, they're like revealed or they come into focus. Um, but yeah. On that, I wanted to ask a little bit. So was that your first, so for those of you who are seeing the image behind us, uh, a lot of Sam's work involves the physical desecration of books, often uh, medical books, uh, legal books, um, books of knowledge, power, uh, social structure. Uh, that's a lot of what you're seeing behind you is the, those books being torn apart, skinned, and uh, reimagined as uh, kind of minimalist grids often. Um, was that your first foray into working with books, the 48 portraits? And uh, could you describe your, your response to that material and, um, and, and how, from a kind of material perspective, how that affected your, your studio work? Yeah, you know, I went into grad school with sort of working with the camera and like work, making work through the lens, if you will. And it's, in a way, it wasn't, it's really not a complete departure because I'm still working with photographic imagery, if you will, but really getting more into using material. And for me, sort of like physically using that material, which was, you know, a direct, had a direct connection with, you know, what I was referencing was very important. But the encyclopedia itself sort of was like a stand in for a power structure, if you will, because it dictates like information that's shared, what's important. And there's a lot of important information that's left out. So even thinking about, you know, pre-internet, like being in school and dealing with, you know, research and using re reference materials, um, being very limited to the amount of information that, you know, that could be, that was at my disposal. And so it was sort of like a way of kind of like desecrating it, breaking it down. And yeah, like, you know, reimagining it, like you said. Um, <clears throat> 
but you know, and then shortly after that, I started breaking the book material down more. So what you see are the book, the sort of the skins of the covers, and I'm peeling them away from the cardboard that makes the cover rigid. And you know, sort of the the perfect grid that you see, if you will, where they're they're lined up, you know, top to bottom, side to side, was how I originally um, made the works. And then over time, I've you know gone from like cutting them up and overlay overlapping them. Now I'm even pulping the material, um, pulping the book cover material, and sort of you know applying it as paint, if you will. Thank you, thank you. I really liked um, what 48 Portrait said about, um, you know, elevating people of identities that have been historically traditionally underexposed. Um, in that same vein, I was wondering, like, in what ways, if any, has your own identity played into your artistic practices? I think in, in terms of, I guess my own identity comes through my, my, um, my personal experience. I, re I remember um not you know a few days ago i saw this like clip with Denzel washington and it was about he was asked a question about um the decision to sort of make films films that incorporated um cast members of color or individuals who were uh, producing f those films and um and he talked about he referenced i can't remember the name of the two filmmakers, but he referenced two different white filmmakers who were making works that were a different genre. And he talked about culture. And he said, you know, each of those filmmakers wouldn't make the other person's type of work. So he, instead of like reducing it to color, if you will, he talked about culture. So it was sort of about my upbringing and my experience and you, and even talking about, you know, using these reference materials as a young person rather I'm like doing a research paper in school and things like that. But it wasn't really, what was available wasn't directly in relationship to like my personal experience. So that's sort of, it comes out in the work that way as well. Um, this is a bit off script, but I'm thinking about that, um, the, the reference materials, uh, as, as we say, reference materials, things that we reference as sources of knowledge, uh, which then structure knowledge. Um, I find it a little bit um, maybe apt or ironic that you're able to acquire these materials simply because they're now becoming obsolete. And I'm wondering how you figure that obsolescence into your practice, how you, uh, you gather materials that are being literally cast aside or shed um, and, and making them relevant again, uh, sort of in a way uh, desecrating them, but also sort of resurrecting them in a way. Um, and I, I'm just curious if you think about that, uh, the kind of analog, the digital uh, aspects of uh, the circulation of knowledge and how you do research as an artist. I mean, I imagine the Richter piece you may have researched on the internet. Yeah, I, yeah, I did research that, that information on the internet. And it's really interesting. You know, there was this idea that when information became available on the web, there was this idea that, you know, it was sort of, um, maybe sort of not limited and but i think you know that it's for example like wikipedia if you will and this idea that you know a number of different people can just like put in information or like edit it and whatnot but still there's there's i think the same type of people who were originally you know making encyclopedias or inputting that information it really hasn't changed a whole lot and also you know there's the issue of of sort of you know, um, limiting the, inf like on the internet, like there's certain things like look up that, you know, maybe at some point in time, like some in the early part of the internet where it was more available, but now it's sort of being controlled. The information is being controlled and it's sort of like, you know, probably even more so. And so, you know, there's this, idea, this thought of like, you know, how far away should we move from, you know, the, the physical book, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that doesn't really come up a whole lot with them making the work, but it's, you know, as far as the material goes and sourcing the material, it's, it's pretty easy to come by. And especially at this point in time, because, you know, especially with the law books, law books are pretty easy to get. You know, I source them through like Craigslist or eBay or just word of mouth. Um, 
law firms going out of, you know, retiring. Um, but there are, you know, some of these books are like, that I've found are probably, you know, 30, 40 years old, and there's like a price tag on them, and they're pretty expensive per book, like 30 to 50 bucks per book. Um, and now they're just, they don't cost really much of anything. People just want to get rid of them, yeah. Yeah, um, there was a work that came up through the carousel, and I'm hoping it'll come back, which is uh, a work that we now own called Deeper. It's a light blue composition, gridded. Uh, it is not itself actually one of the, the works constructed of books, but it is a print, an aquatint, I believe, based on one of those works. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of translating these compositions here, these very tactile material compositions, into something that's more uh, uh, reproduced and what that process is like collaborating with a printer. Yeah, the I'm that piece was made that that print was made that was like my first print project and we made four different editions in that first project. Um, I, forget, I think it was 2018 I can't remember exactly, but we used an actual work to sort of make that and by you know, doing the aqua tent and like using a copper plate and sort of, you know, I, I can't remember all the terminology used for it because I'm not a print expert, but <laughs> there's this material that we used. It's like kind of like tar and you would roll that onto an actual piece like this, if you will. And then that would be run through a press on top of the copper plate to create sort of like the, the image, if you will. And then that's like dipped in acid <clears throat> and then that's used to make the prints. Um, but it was, I think in, in terms of doing that, like making, you know, just sort of to, to, to be very transparent, if you will, it's also creating work where people have access to it. Cause you know, through my career, the price of work, you know, it, it goes up and sort of, you know, some people are priced out of it, but there's still an opportunity for people to have the work, if you will. But it's also, I think in the process of doing that, it was, I worked with a group in Berkeley called uh, Paulson Fontaine Press. And it's, it was a great process because, you know, kind of getting on the studio, I worked by myself in the studio and, and then getting on the studio and like being in a place where I'm around different, different artists who have different input and different ideas was um, really wonderful. So we kind of create this community. Um, but I think it sort of, you know, gave me a lot of information as well in terms of like thinking and, and the way that I, you know, make work and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, and we've done, I know we've run two projects. I think we've made six different types of prints. Um, and then you saw in, in the slide, there was a piece that was actually made of football. So I played, you know, American football, even in college. And <clears throat> I had made some work that referenced my experience with that, but I sort of departed from it and then came back to it through the whole thing with Colin Kaepernick and his protest and sort of thinking about, you know, that power structure, if you will. Um, yeah, so that's how that came about. I, it's, I'm, I'm actually quite glad you brought up the, the football works. I recall seeing a show you, you had in Chicago where you, you skinned, um, big skins, I guess they're called, right? Like colloquially, the, the footballs and arranged them into canvases similar to the books. Was that process intuitive to you? I mean, was there, um, I can imagine, so you, you played football uh, when you were younger and I think also maybe in college as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, did that feel, was that project more sort of uh, personal in terms of your identity, um, while at the same time it being kind of refracted through a sort of national political discourse about uh, racial protests and justice and equity in sports? Yeah, it was definitely personal. I don't talk about it much publicly, but I'll dive into it. Um, so I played, I played football at Taylor University, and I think, you know, definitely on the field and off the field within the classroom, there were sort of like subversive racial problems that I experienced. Um, you know, at the time when I played on the football team, there were no more than, you know, a handful of non-white players. And there were definitely things that were evident where, you know, we weren't given as much opportunity to, to participate on the, on the playing field. Um, and you know, it was it was a very challenging challenging time for me, um, but I think definitely through 
my practice of making. So I wasn't making art at the time. I took a photography class my last semester of school. And at that time I had the semester that I took the photography class, I had a year of eligibility to play football, but I decided to not do so. Um, but through making it sort of like really enabled me to process all that, um, which was, you know, I don't know, it's it been very liberating, sort of like, kind of like really taking control of that sort of like that personal narrative, if you will, and processing it. Yeah, and there is a, right now, I believe there's some images from that, including some, okay, so those are the footballs there. You can see it's much more kind of uh, deliberate there where you can see the, the footballs. Um, I wanted to ask you, since we're all in this strange world where we're all uh, masked up and I have to kind of <laughs> make sure that I'm uh, properly mic through here and, um, you know, we're emerging from, from COVID from, I don't know how long it's been, a year and a half of um, retreating to the internet, retreating to um, somewhat uh, kind of solitude uh, with, with also that virtual connection. But, um, you know, there's this idea of uh, the artist in the studio as a kind of uh, a solitary practice or a meditative practice. It sounds like you don't have assistance to work with. Okay, so you work in truly alone. And I'm curious, you know, has, how, if at all, has COVID affected your work? Was it really, you know, was it a retreat? Did you find more time in the studio? I know you were busy because you had shows, some shows that you couldn't even go to uh, in person, including the, the Le Long show in Paris. But, um, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot this year that artists have, have seemed to have uh, kind of um, maybe um, a, a lot of time to reflect that they may not have had. And I'm curious if, if you had that experience or a different one entirely. Yeah, the experience was, I think in a lot of ways when I, you know, make work and, and um, as you saw from the piece before, that was work that was made from art books and this as well. I'll talk a little bit about that before answer, in answering your question, but I chose to work with art books because it's sort of like I'm referencing sort of the hierarchy of art within the art world and different mediums and like painting being at the top and things being below that. And so it's interesting to make this work and I call them paintings, but I'm not using paint. So sort of like trying to disrupt the terminology that's associated with power and sort of, yeah, if that makes sense. But for me last year, I think we, you know, in making these works, I'm sort of like referencing these, you know, these social issues that sort of, I, I, I feel like maybe that aren't at the forefront of a conversation if you, you know, if you just like, have, you know, meet someone for the first time and you're not really like diving into these like difficult topics, if you will. And it's sort of like a part of it's like, you know, I wish, so I like wishing that, you know, more and more um, as a point of interaction. And I think through last year, there was a moment to where it was like, it, it was happening, you know, very real. And it was, you know, so close to home that I had to like take a break. Like I didn't go to the studio for maybe like two or three months. Um, and that was sort of how I dealt with it. And then finally got back into it and then started working more with these pulp works. Um, because I think at the same time too, I didn't want to sort of come out on the other end doing the same thing. And I wanted to sort of evolve and like have the work evolve as well. And can you talk, I mean, specifically about uh, this piece, which I think is called Malcolm, um, and there was a piece before it, and you incorporated some elements of the American flag in that. Curious about that. Was that, you know, how did that material choice come about? Um, you know, uh, what what drew you to that specific material? And also, I'd, I'd separately, but also connected, I'd love to hear more about the paper pulping process, which was important. Uh, in in your work early on in 2012 with 48 portraits, you you used a blender apparently to <laughs> pulp those works. Uh, yes, there. Um, and then since then, have been um, much more uh, uh, focused on that kind of uh, collage element of the um, of the gridded um, the gridded covers. So going back to pulping, um, just um, curious, you know, what what new ap avenues opportunities has that provided for you? How has it moved your work in different directions? And, you know, how does it relate to the, the past work? I, some of the pieces feel much more abstract, actually. There's literally fuzzier in a way. Um, and much, in my perception, much more about the relationship of form and color. Um, much more sort of formalist, I guess. 
Yeah. In terms of, you know, the abstraction of the work for me, um, I talk, I think about this way in which we as people are abstracted and sort of like distracted from like the details of the things that are going on around us. Um, and in the process of like sort of like in pulping the material, I'm abstracting the process and you, it becomes like completely unrecognizable because if you look at that and I say, you know, that's book material, like you can, you can visibly see it. Um, but you know, how do I push that? But also at the same time too, it's sort of, for me, it's like keeping the work in the process fresh. Um, Cause I don't know, it would be really boring to kind of do the same thing over and over and over again for me, even if it's working. Um, so at the same time too, it's like, it's a bit of a risk. So it's fun to like, you know, challenge myself and push it more and put it out there and sort of see how people respond to it. Um, does that sort of answer the question? I feel, I feel like you kind of answered, asked like two or three questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the old art historian uh, evasion technique. Now, uh, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging talking with an artist about their own work because, you know, I have interpretation of it, of course, as a viewer, also as an art historian, as a curator and a critic, um, and you have your studio practice. And then, of course, there's a public audience, which includes artists as well. Um, and we have quite a bit of an online audience. Uh, hello, everyone uh, out there in cyberspace. Um, and I know we do have MFA students in the house as well as out there. And I think, Mark, you wanted to ask a little bit about that from a student's perspective. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. This one concerns the MFA students, um, but then the other one's just me. Um, so the first one, yeah, is uh, do we have any MFA students in here right now? Maybe, possibly. That's exciting. Awesome. So, or maybe BFA students. I um, was just wondering if there's any advice that you would offer those students that you wish you had when you were going through the process. Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that I experienced when I was going through my MFA studies is that so you know, I have a, a committee of, of faculty members who are sort of advisees, if you will, and you do studio visits with them. And I had this one particular person who I felt like wasn't into my work. He was like extremely sort of challenging. And I was like, and I, I you know, considered like trying to replace him, but I, I chose not to. And I chose to sort of like push forth with a challenge and sort of like use it as a thing to sort of, you know, when I got to a point in my work to where, you know, maybe there was sort of like this affirmation, if you will, but, um, but he wasn't going to do that unless the work got to a certain place. And I didn't sort of, I didn't understand that, but I think, um, like instinctually, like something told me that, and then it happened, like there was this month, like I was working on the portraits and, um, and I would talk about it and just wasn't, it was like, it wasn't feeling, it was like, kind of like he was like in another place, like even though when he was in the studio, but when it happened, like when it physically happened, he came in and he said, this is working. And the conversation immediately changed. So I think, <clears throat> I think one of the advice, uh, you know, a, a piece of advice that I give is just sort of allow yourself to be challenged and, you know, don't always sort of, you know, lean towards a space where, you know, you're sort of being patted on the back. Because if you're not being challenged, you're not going to grow. Um, and I think too, and another thing that I got that really didn't happen until after um, graduate school, because when I was working on this work, I wasn't sure where, what direction I was going to go. Um, but I, you know, I spoke to someone who mentored me for a few years, and he told me that I should sort of stick to the material and like really, you know, push it and see where I come to, because he said that the thing that they don't teach you in graduate school is that, or the thing that they tell you to sort of like do one thing and then go immediately to something else. Um, so that was one of the things that I really wasn't aware of. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had no idea I was gonna continue working with this book material. And once I was told that, so I wasn't quite, I didn't get to the point yet to where I was, peeling the book covers away from the cardboard. And once I did, like I did, so the process of doing that is like soak them in, in water and it sort of, it loosens the adhesive and it peels away. And the texture is like really amazing. And I laid the first couple of books out on the floor and I was like, this is it. Like I knew it like right away. Um, but yeah, really push, even though you don't know what you're going to get, but like 
explore it as much as you can, even no matter how painful it is. Yeah, thank you. I think that leads kind of into my next question. Uh, looking at your your work, the first thing that strikes me is is the presentation and, and obviously the visuals. And it sounds like from what you just described, first you started with the raw materials and just started putting things together. But I wonder for many of these, some of them are, are pretty complex uh, looking. So I wonder like how does, is it kind of like you have like a dream or like you see an image in your head and then you source the materials or how does that process work? And that's probably maybe it leads way to advice for many of us who consider ourselves artists in some capacity or another. So, yeah. I don't have sort of really a, a vision in my head. I was once asked if I sketch things out before I do them and I, I don't do that either, but it's sort of, you know, as I was working with, I would sort of give you the order of the material that I, in the, when I started working with it, the encyclopedia were first. And then, you know, when sort of the recordings of police brutality like became like very prevalent and that led me to law books, which made sense. Um, and I've also worked with medical books for particular reasons and then art books and then the football material. And then I've also used, I made one piece where I worked with um, life preserver vest to reference refugee crisis. Um, so for me, it's all about an idea and like trying to find the material that, that best suits that, which I'm trying to reference. Uh, I'm certainly happy to entertain audience questions either in person or virtually at this time, um, if that's something that is of interest. I believe we have a young man over there. <laughs> And I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly jump in and say the question was about the material practice of sewing the works together and using a sewing machine. It just it made sense in terms of like putting the material together. Um, I don't know really other any other way to explain it, but the, the only other time that I'd used a sewing machine really was like in home ec in seventh grade. <laughs> Um, you know, you, it's so fascinating to me because I, um, you seem to have sort of um, fallen into an artistic practice. You mentioned taking a photography course when you were playing football at Taylor. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, it's, it must have been an interesting moment to decide that career. And, or, or maybe it wasn't a career decision to you at that point. But, um, you know, do you ever think about going back to photography, uh, it seems like that again, and I'm touching again on the 48 portraits because I think it is such a a, a really evocative work. Um, you know, photography um, is significant to that work in terms of the the representation of the the 48 individuals. You know, does photography and your training in that play into your work at all? Um, obviously, it would be quite oblique uh, looking at these newer works. I think you. Know, I guess to back up when, when you talked about sort of kind of like falling into making, I think even at a younger age, I was, I don't talk about this either, but I was, <laughs> when I was younger, I um, was into RC car modeling <laughs> and I raced cars, um, but there was just something very pleasing about, you know, constructing, deconstructing, those models um but even just like other things like i remember you know several different times like taking apart um one particular time a, a radio like an am fm radio that was like part of a stereo set because something had broken in it and trying to like fix it um and there's just something very comforting about just sitting there like in my own by myself <clears throat> and getting lost into like just like working with something with my with my hands, if you will. Um, so I think that probably has definitely like carried over into this process. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you. We have questions from our virtual audience as well. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the surface that you work on? Um, wood panels, for example, stretch bars. And does that deduction um, affect the work? 
Um, it seems like your work is very sculptural, even though it is flat. I'm not sure how to sort of interpret that question in terms of like what surface do I work on. Um, but oh, well, so they do go on canvas, and I use um, a matte matte medium that works like a glue to like adhere them to the canvas. You know, it's so the the person I you know go back to talking about the person who mentored me for a couple of years was the artist by the name of Mark Rafford, and he sort of works in a similar way. He calls the works paintings, but it doesn't use paint. And he was the one who told me to like push the material. But um, so when I came to this, I was the first works that I displayed, like they weren't on canvas and I just pinned them to the wall because I didn't sort of like want to come out of that immediately and like throw them on canvas. He could, but he gave me permission to do it, if you will. Um, yeah, so that was, you know, it was really interesting because I, I wanted to immediately, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, they end up on canvas and then the pulped works, they're actually, they're on canvas as well, but they're backed with um, plywood. So it's like firm and so it doesn't flex and potentially peel off. Yeah, so the question was that was asked was um, what artists I might be influenced by. Um, I think early on I was influenced, like through photography, I was influenced by, you know, like Gordon Parks um, and a few other photographers, but not really so much painters or anyone else because it was really the material that led me into this way of making and not so much seeing other works but yeah that that work by Gerhard Richter it was it was more of a kind of a critique if you will because I kind of thought you know what's so interesting about 48 portraits of white men um and that was it so <laughs> Thank you. We have another question from the virtual audience. Um, could you speak about any relationship, if any, between your work and other artists like Anne Hamilton or Buzz Spector or, or RJ, um, I'm sorry, RB Kataj, who have also um, used old book in, as their source material? Yeah, it, it's been a long time since I've been asked to sort of like, you know, reference like different genres of art in relationship to my work or other artists. But honestly, I don't. And, you know, no matter how it may come off, like I really am not so concerned, I don't care um, because I sort of don't look at, really look a whole lot of other artists um, unless there's, you know, I, there are peers that I'm connected to that I have relationships to and I look at their work, but I don't really go and look at other work in, in terms of like having it influence my work, um, even though, there's, you know, some sort of reference or relationship visually to other artists, but I don't, I don't do that. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, I had a conversation one time recently with someone and they sort of like talked about, you know, artists and their inability to like think about or reference like things historically, but like, I don't know, I, I'm kind of <laughs> really um, into sort of, you know, going to the beat of my own drum, if you will, as cliche as it may sound, and not really um, going along with sort of the status quo of like how things should be or how an artist should operate. And I operate in my own way. And um, typically I don't really go into that. I've you know, been asked to talk about my work in relationship to, you know, minimal, minimalism or abstraction, historical, you know, in a historical way, but I don't it's about the material in relationship to these social issues that I'm that I'm thinking about, um, and that's that. Okay, 
Okay, awesome. Did we have any um, audience questions? Any more audience questions, maybe? Yes. In, in some of these works, at least, sort of liberating cloth from the, the binding of the book and the protective cover of the book, and then piecing them together in a way that very much references quilts and quilting tradition. Um, is, is that is that something that you're thinking about as you're working, or and then and then physically stitching them together as well? Yeah. So. <laughs> I will try my best, but as I understand, the question was about the hierarchy of art and how um, that maybe plays into your working process. Yeah, no, so the reference of quilts and, and so the, the hierarchy of material, but yeah, I, I had, we were talking about earlier, I had an opportunity, there's like in an exhibition of, of G's Ben quilters. And so they were all, they were all female artists and I was like the only male artist that was in the group. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I equate it to the relationship of how we give value to people and we don't give value to people. And so like in relationship of disrupting that, if that makes sense. Um, you know, Yeah, so the, yeah, the, so you, you reference the relationship and giving sort of, you know, pulling from something else and, and, and reimagining it and giving power to it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really like this idea of, of sort of going into situations and, and um, giving power, like trying to elevate something because I think we, we, I have this huge issue with like not wanting to elevate things that are typically sort of felt that they should be left in that place. And sort of like, I don't know, creating, you know, a, a, a broader spectrum of, of opportunity, if you will. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, there's one artist that I think of that, Bisa Butler, um, who is, you know, making these amazing quotes and, I mean, they're beautiful. And so, you know, why shouldn't artists like that sort of be limited to, you know, um, importance because of the choice of, of material. And it's important to, to, to elevate that and sort of give power to that and give power and also in a relationship to giving power to people who we feel, you know, don't deserve it. And I'm going to go off on a tangent because we were talking a little bit about the issue of of, of where we are right now with like people going back to work and not wanting to go back to work um, in reference to the lack, you know, minimum wage not being where it should be um, and the, the lack of importance that we give to people who um, hold, you know, those positions. And we really need to start thinking differently about the situation. Thank you. Um, did we have any other questions from the audience, both online and in person? <laughs> uh, just, um, you're, I, I, not to be too contrarian, but um, I'm just curious because you, you mentioned earlier about pushing your practice beyond what works. And I believe you used air quotes. I'm not really sure. I, maybe I imagine them, but, um, and my interpretation of when you say what works, I assume that's market value or the reception of the audience reception of the work. Um, and certainly to a certain extent, your works um, are, can be sort of categorized in that sort of realm of two-dimensional work and painting, right? So canvas. So there is an element where you're sort of sneaking into that, that hierarchy at the very top, right? Like that. Um, I'm curious about that. Do you think about how your work uh, either either uh, flips or maybe uh, find its way into to the market and the audience reception more easily because it is um, it is um, most related to painting. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely there is a bit of that, and sort of like really thinking about. I don't know, there, there's so many layers to sort of making and um, sort of how the work is perceived and accepted. Um, but yeah, when I was first started doing the pulp, and so yeah, I, I added a medium to the pulp. Originally, I wasn't, but I've added a medium to the pulp that sort of makes it. And it it binds it, but it also makes the color sort of like more brilliant, if you will. And I was like, wow, this, it looks like paint, um, but it's not. So, and it's kind of getting, it's really sort of interesting. It wasn't an intention, to, it wasn't an intention to get closer to that, but it was the original intention was to, you know, sort of abstract the material more and change it up. And, it, and I just sort of came to that point naturally. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the original idea to try to get as close to a painting as possible, if you will. But it, yeah, it works. <laughs> uh, we have a, a comment from a virtual audience member who um, just was offering that if you would someday like to do something with great works of the Western world, which is all by white males, um, just comment from David Moore that he would be happy. He has a full set that he would be happy to <laughs> to give to you. <laughs> um, and I have a question. I'm wondering, um, as a youngster, as a as a kid, if there were any um, early experiences, what kind of experiences you might have had with art, or maybe not. Um, I think probably my closest experience to to art as a as a kid was. My mother, my mother had like a lot of natural ability um, to draw and paint, but I wasn't, I, I didn't go into this field because she did that, but it, you know, just the strange thing. But I grew up in a small town where arts wasn't, it wasn't a thing. So there wasn't much, there really wasn't any exposure to the arts. Like I played sports growing up and that's sort of like what you did in the town that I grew up in. And if you were an artist, you're kind of like looked at as a weirdo maybe. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think with that being said, I'm kind of in this space now where I'm thinking more about sort of like breaking down barriers and like kind of bridging these gaps. And I'm thinking about, there's a curatorial project that I want to do that has a relationship to sports and art and sort of like, how do we, you know, cross these, these, fields of interest, if you will. Okay, that was uh, excellent. Uh, oh, okay, the online audience is voracious, great. So we have a question about um, how political, the political situation um, might, might influence your work going forward. Um, and also, are you influenced by the news? And do you feel like doing something like to deconstruct TV or the internet? <laughs> Trying to stay uh, as far away from the news as much as possible right now. Um, but I think anything and everything like has a potential to be political, even, and it's probably said like, it's not, not my words, but even choosing to not participate is being political. Um, but to deconstruct televisions, it's, no, I don't, that hasn't ever crossed my mind. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, they, you know, in terms of like working in different ways, like I think you, you kind of asked earlier about photography and I've, we talked about earlier, I've, I've been thinking about um, revisiting that medium, but it has to really make sense. Um, <clears throat> but I have to like kind of really, I think carve out a space and time to do that because there's sort of like, I mean, I'm producing for exhibitions and art fairs and um, yeah, hopefully at some point I'll just be like, okay, I'm not doing this and I'm gonna you know visit this. And I think it's important to do that. I think um, to sort of like, I don't know, I'm really interested in going back to that medium and like, um, experiencing it because it's been so long. Um, I have this really strange thing with, with memory. My memory isn't so great, but it's really a sort of attached to emotion. 
So I think I won't really like feel it unless I pick up the camera and maybe like I'm in a dark room, <clears throat> but I'm interested and curious about it through this, the time that I stopped doing it up until now, like the things that I've learned and come to know and how I may um, <clears throat> image things differently, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's another question from virtual audience that I, I apologize. I did not give you a chance to respond to the question about the great works. Um, whether the <laughs> um, yes. So um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can no longer see the question, but um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I will follow up with you afterwards. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that's probably a good wrap for tonight. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us in person and virtually. Um, yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much uh, for talking with us today. Your presence means a lot. Um, I just have some announcements for things that are coming up in the year. Um, upcoming, we invite you to join us for our next visiting artist talk with Zakia Najiba Dumas O'Neill on October 7th at 7 p.m., immediately following the October 1st Thursday after hours at the museum. Um, In-person and virtual options are available for that as well. Uh, Zakia will discuss her artistic practice, which prioritizes so queer social relationships, um, Black women's identity formation, family, social architectures, and the desire for connectedness. Uh, we also invite you to art and movie programs uh, this fall. First up, Lauren Rickman, assistant curator of photography, will discuss three works uh, by the photographer Lee Miller from her surrealist period in the 1930s and 40s before IU Cinema screens a double feature of the films capturing Lee Miller and The Blood of the Poet. Then in December, IU Cinema presents virtual screenings of the films When We Gather and When We Gather Together. Um, artist Maria Magdalena Campos Pons is scheduled to be present for a vir virtual conversation and interactive Q&A um, for that as well. Um, and then treat yourself to a free self-care Sunday, uh, Saturday rather, uh, with us with art making, self-exploration and programming to nurture yourselves, you all deserve it. RSVP for a Making Mandela's Workshop or uh, Let's Talk About Mental Health, a virtual conversation exploring mental health from multiple perspectives, offering hands-on activities that you can do at home um, or the wellness retreats with Slow Flow Yoga and Art in October and November. Those are super awesome. Um, and you'll get to see me again probably at those. So, <laughs> um, um, and then students, we invite you to new exclusive museum experiences for students with students. Join us for an exclusive gallery adventure uh, during IU Family Weekend or for a behind the scenes experience in November. Uh, there's something different for each month, which is awesome. Um, and then lastly, or almost lastly, if you have an idea for a program, uh, to happen here at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, then we encourage um, any ideas proposed by, by IU or the local community. We offer a program called Community Creative. Uh, we invite you to propose ideas that are um, inspired by our museum, connected to our museum mission, um, and we encourage learning, growing, and becoming a better human through meaningful experiences with art. So if you have any ideas on any of that, please let us know. Um, if selected, we'll work with you to develop the idea into a program. Um, and then today's program, and everything that we do here at Indiana University Eskenazi Museum of Art um, is made possible by, by philanthropy. We would like to thank Greg and Judy Somerville, Linda Watson, the Director's Circle, and Women's Philanthropy Leadership Council, again, for allowing us to continue providing these free programs uh, to you all. So if you would like to join in support of the museum, please visit our museum's website to make a donation. Gifts big and small make all the difference. Um, and lastly, now from all of us at the Eskenazi Museum of Art, take care, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and have a great evening. Thank you.